In early August of 2021, my next guest made headlines all over the world when it was announced he had contracted COVID-19. By the middle of that month, he'd been placed on a ventilator and was struggling for his life. He's been on the slow road to recovery since leaving the hospital in September. He's here tonight to talk about not only his illness and his extraordinary recovery, but some news of the day. Please welcome the former head of the Vatican's highest court, one of the world's foremost canon lawyers, Raymond Cardinal Burke. Your eminence, thank you for joining us. And of course, as you can see, he joins us from Rome. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Raymond. I'm pleased to be with you. Uh, first of all, how are you feeling and are you having any lingering effects from the COVID recovery? Well, in general, I'm, I'm feeling very well and I'm uh, returning more or less to a, a normal pace of life. Uh, the, the lingering uh, effect has been on my lungs. The, 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 the virus uh, attacked in a very vicious way. Uh, my lungs, and so they, there's some healing yet that has to take place. And the doctors mm -hmm. tell me that they, they don't know a lot about this, how long it takes, but that it could take up, up upwards of a year uh, or so. And mm. I, I, I'm getting stronger all the time, and, uh, but uh, that's the one lingering effect. Uh, of course, I was on a ventilator for nine days, which were wow. nine days lost for me. I don't have any recollection at all of that. And so when I came out from the from that intubation, uh, I couldn't even stand up, uh, and I had to regain all of my ability to to stand, to walk, to negotiate stairs. And thanks be to God, that has that has gone well. And that was part of the reason for the long recovery. And then, as people yeah. who've had this will tell you, that uh, there was this terrible fatigue that I had for. I left the hospital on September third. And for about a month, uh, I was just tired all the time. It didn't matter how many hours I slept at night. I would wake up mm. in the morning tired. It's a terrible thing. But it, that passed, too, thanks be to God. And, and uh, yeah. uh, I tire a little earlier than the day in the day than I used to. But uh, during the day, I'm quite fine. Well, Your, Your Eminence, it, it's a miracle, given that you were on a ventilator, that you've come back and, and, you know, have recovered. So a lot of people, frankly, don't make it off that ventilator. So I, I was very concerned when I first read of that. So, you know, thank God you, you made it through and you're on the mend. Now, you celebrated your first Mass, the traditional Latin Mass, after recovery this past December 11th. And you thanked above all God and, and all those who prayed for your recovery. Were you surprised by the outpouring of the prayers and the kind words from so many vis-a-vis uh, -vis your recovery? Yes, I, I, I became ill quite suddenly, and then I was very quickly put on the ventilator, and so, what, but when I came out uh, from that, uh, I think it was on the 20th of August, and I began to, to read these messages and to learn about all the people who are praying for me. I was really overwhelmed with it and just filled with a, a profound gratitude. Uh, and I have to say that when they took the, 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 vent, the tubing out and I was conscious again, that I had an immediate sense that our Blessed Mother had been, had been taking care of me all the time. And, and, and I, I say this very sincerely. The doctors had informed my, my good sister Mary uh, that there was really not any hope that I was going to survive this and that she should put my things in order. Uh, mm. And I, I, mean, I have no question in my mind that it was all these prayers that were raised up to our Lord and, and the prayers that he heard and, and, and saved me for some work now that he has for, for me to do. But I had, I had immediately that very strong sense and it, it has remained with me. Uh, it was, uh, it really was miraculous, and we should never doubt the power of prayer. But in, in this instance, I I have experienced it in a remarkable way because I I knew I was dying, and uh, I, I did really uh, wasn't at all certain that I would would survive. Uh, yeah. uh, and when I then gained my consciousness again, I. Uh, and I learned about all these prayers that were offered. I, I understood what had happened. Yeah. In, in many reports uh, of your illness, 
you were portrayed, Your Eminence, as a vaccine denier and skeptic. Even the Pope made reference to you as a denier on the papal plane returning uh, on his trip from Slovakia in September. He said even in the College of Cardinals there are some deniers, and one of those, poor guy, is hospitalized with the virus. The irony of life. What did you think when you heard those comments that you were a denier and a skeptic of vaccines? Are you? Well, uh, no, I, I, I have never said to anyone that uh, he or she should not be vaccinated. I've insisted that the question of, of, being, of having the vaccination is a personal decision. It's an exercise of a fundamental human right. Uh, and that I'm absolutely opposed to forced vaccination to these these mandates, but I've I have not taken a position uh, of, of being against uh, 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 the vaccine. On the other hand, uh, we have only one Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. We put ourselves in His hands, and uh, uh, vaccinating the whole world is not going to save the world. And uh, sure. there is this kind of rhetoric t uh, today where people think that if that if everyone were vaccinated, uh, everything would be just fine. And I, that is incorrect thinking for a Christian. Yeah, well, and, and, and scientifically invalid, I might add, as events have proven, particularly with this Omicron yes. variant. I mean, the Vatican, however, Your Eminence, is currently mandating vaccines for all employees, it's been encouraging that everyone, including children, be vaccinated. Several members of the Pontifical Swiss Guard have lost their jobs for not receiving the jab. Now, there are no numbers of reporting on other jobs, you know, that have been lost so far. We just don't know. Your reaction to the Vatican's vaccine mandate, especially now when, as we mentioned, it's been widely reported, the vaccine's not effective against Omicron. And several European countries have now, namely England and Spain, they've lifted their vaccine mandates. Yes, well, I, uh, the, the Vatican's uh, uh, position on this is, 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 is very severe. There's no question about it. You, you cannot enter, uh, for instance, the Apostolic Palace uh, other offices of the Vatican, uh, unless you can demonstrate that that you are vaccinated, and this is a a very severe uh, policy. And I understand. I don't know personally, but I understand that that there are a number of people who uh, cannot come to work uh, because uh, they're not vaccinated, and of course they are their absence from work is is classified as unjustified, and therefore. They they aren't paid, and uh, and also I had heard that a number of the Swiss guards had to leave the service of the guards because they uh, mm -hmm. chose not to be vaccinated. Um, I, as I said before, I believe that the forced vaccination is 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 a violation of of human rights, and. Uh, also, uh, there are normal precautions which can be taken with regard to the spreading of any kind of illness, uh, and right. uh, those precautions should be taken. But and it, it's correct. There are a lot of people who've been vaccinated who, who, who now have contracted I, I, seemingly this Omicron uh, uh, variation. To me, the, the, the bottom line is that the, the vaccination as it is is an experimental, is an experiment. And we're asking people not simply because this, we don't have the experience, we don't have the necessary uh, experience okay. with the vaccine. And uh, so people who, who, uh, who take the vaccine are accepting to be part of an experiment. Yeah, and as you mentioned, uh, there are there have even been Vatican officials who have now contracted COVID. Uh, many of them triple vaxxed uh, in some cases. It, it, tell me how this squares though with Catholic teaching, because the CDF document of last year, of last December, said you can, in good conscience and as a good Catholic, not decide not to take these vaccines, and that's perfectly licit. But now we seem to be getting a different message, at least in word, from the Vatican, and uh, to say nothing of these mandates they've dropped on employees. 
But what the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith said is Catholic teaching. Uh, it, it, a forced vaccination of people is you know, part of, of Catholic teaching, and uh, I, that's all I can say. I, the, this has mm -hmm. never been uh, uh, in, in the Church's teaching, and the, the document of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the CDF, uh, was clear about that. And, uh, yeah. and we, th I thought that it was understood, but then the the Vatican itself uh, has taken this uh, this position, which really doesn't square uh, with mm -hmm. with that teaching, and, and it, it's it's caused uh, it's causing a great deal of suffering. Yeah, I, I want to move on to another topic, Your Eminence: the continued support of and attacks upon the traditional Latin Mass since Pope Francis's motto proprio, Guardians of Tradition. Uh, that was released in July. Uh, in the Archdiocese of Chicago, where the Latin Mass has practically been banned, Cardinal Blaise Supich issued rules last month on Christmas Day that ban the use of the traditional liturgy on Christmas, Easter, Sunday, and the first Sunday of each month, and other holy days. Now, Cardinal Supich explains his reasoning for these new rules is the following, quote, to foster and make manifest the unity of this local church, as well as to provide all Catholics in the archdiocese an opportunity to offer a concrete manifestation of the acceptance of the teaching of the Second Vatican Council and its liturgical books. Cardinal Burke, what is the fear of the old rite based upon, and is it a challenge, the ongoing celebration of the Latin Mass, is it a challenge in your mind to the Second Vatican Council or the liturgical books that came out of it? The, absolutely not. I, the, in many dioceses now, for, for, for many years, uh, the faithful have been, some of the faithful have been assisting at the, uh, the celebration of the Holy Mass, especially on feast days, according to the the more ancient usage, the usus antique, the extraordinary form, as it's called today, uh, there hasn't been any cause of disunity. In fact, I served in two dioceses, and uh, uh, the, that was a great blessing to have these communities who were uh, mm -hmm. following the, that, those ancient rites as they've been handed down to us from the time of Pope Gregory the Great and, and even before. And these aren't, I don't want to talk about them as if they're simply antiquities, not at all. The sacred liturgy is a living reality. It's Christ himself acting in our midst to sanctify us and at the Holy Mass in the most wonderful way possible by his renewing his sacrifice on Calvary uh, sacramentally and then f nourishing us with his own body and blood. And this... Uh, uh, this remains the reality, and so that the form of the Mass as it uh, was uh, set forth at, after the Council of Trent, but as it had existed for centuries before, is a living reality, and you can't, uh, you can't deny that. And uh, with regard to the Second Vatican Council, many things that happened after the Council with regard to the Sacred Liturgy have no foundation whatsoever uh, in the in the documents on the sacred liturgy, and we know well, intelligent people who have studied these matters know well that there were many abuses following the council, the so-called spirit of the council, and the whole way in which the liturgy was reformed, uh, 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 the rites of, were reformed, and so there are legitimate questions. Some of them have been addressed. Uh, some yeah. need yet to be addressed, but. Uh, Pope, Pope, Pope St. John Paul II, for instance, in the last years of his pontificate, was continually insisting uh, on the need to, uh, to address uh, the sacred liturgy and to restore the, the transcendence of the liturgical action, namely that it's Jesus Christ himself who acts uh, uh, in our midst, comes into our midst through the sacred liturgy. And... Uh, and of course, Pope Benedict XVI was a wonderful teacher in that regard, and and Sumorum Pontificum, his motu proprio by which he made more accessible the the celebration of the of the extraordinary form, as he called it, mm -hmm. uh, was a great gift, and w was uh, proceeding in a very the exercise of that of that gift 
uh, use of that gift was uh, was being uh, was a great gift in the church. I don't understand this. I I have a lot yeah. of contact with with uh, uh, oratories and parishes that celebrate the extraordinary form with priests, and uh, it, it's all positive. I don't. They don't think of themselves as being the real church or the better Catholics than anyone else. They simply find a tremendous spiritual nourishment uh, through these ancient rites, mm-hmm. the, 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 the traditional form of the Mass. And uh, why should that be denied to them? Uh, you, you, you're, you're eminent. A, a, a priest in the Chicago diocese asked to be allowed to use the ad orientum posture facing the East during Mass. He was denied. Uh, when he protested, he was charged with inciting disobedience against the diocesan bishop. Has the ad orientum posture been abrogated, forbidden, by the council or the church? And what does all of that have to do with the Latin Mass? Well, any Mass can be celebrated facing the Lord or facing the East ad orientum or versus dominum. Uh, uh, and in fact, m- many people tell me, and I, it makes perfect sense, that it's a very beautiful thing to have the priest at the head of the congregation offering the Mass, and that everyone is facing our Lord. So th- this makes it clear that the, the sacrifice is our Lord's sacrifice. It's uh, we mm-hmm. worship in spirit and truth in, in our Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, that is nothing in particular to do with the, it's true that, that uh, the, the more ancient usage it was certainly to celebrate Mass uh, facing the Lord, facing the East. But uh, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't find anything in the documents of the Second Vatican Council that would uh, lead to a banning of the, uh, of, of the traditional uh, way of the, the traditional posture or position of the priest during the celebration of the Mass. And uh, why this mm-hmm. is now being brought forward, I don't understand. Your, Your Eminence, the, the, the practical effect of this, I think uh, people haven't taken or given due consideration in Rome. Uh, what I'm hearing is so many of these Catholic communities, and again, these are small groups of Catholics, but they're fervent. The church is packed for these, these uh, l- traditional Latin masses. Many of them are now going over to these uh, St. Pius X chapels, the Society of St. Pius X chapels. Is the intention here on the part of some in Rome to drive those Catholics attached to this rite to the Society of St. Pius X and then declare them all schismatics at some later date? Why create this division while talking of accompaniment? Right. I... I, I don't know. I've been told that too. That the that the thinking of some is that that anyone who uh, is attracted to the the more ancient usage the, uh, should simply go over to the priestly society of Saint Pius the uh, Tenth. But that's absolutely wrong because the the more ancient usage is an integral part of the life of the church. It has been uh, along all the centuries, and even uh, after the introduction of the the Novus Order, as it's called, or the more recent usage, the church is always permitted uh, uh, to individuals and to groups the possibility of a, of the of use of following the the more ancient usage, and so uh, right. uh, this idea that somehow if you uh, are attracted to the uh, Lusus Antique, we are, you, you're a schismatic. I mean, this is simply uh, wrong, and, and, and it's wrong to drive people in that direction. But our Lord is with us in the church. He told us he would remain with us always in the church, and so we have to stay in the church and and uh, fight to, uh, to, to preserve and to, to promote and cultivate uh, the liturgical life of the church uh, uh, also through the through the extraordinary form. And so I, I tell mm-hmm. people, we don't have a choice. St. Athanasius, he was exiled. He was ex- excommunicated. He uh, suffered so many humiliations for defending the truth of the faith, but he never left the church. He, and Padre Pio is another example, more recent. Uh, mm-hmm. he, he suffered a great deal 
at the hands of the, of the Vatican, and, and yet he, he remained faithfully in the church, and this is what we have to do. And our Lord isn't mm-hmm. going to permit, I, I know this, our Lord is not going to permit that this beautiful gift uh, of, the, uh, of the more ancient usage, the beautiful gift of, the, of, the, of these rites, Will be lost. He, he just, and it's mm. clear that he hasn't permitted it. And uh, uh, since the time of the of the council, there's been a continual mm-hmm. growth and uh, uh, in interest. And in, I, uh, in in the ancient, uh, the more ancient usage, and I uh, uh, know so many lay faithful and also priests who have told me that uh, they being able to assist at the holy mass. Uh, in the according to the Usus Antique we are uh, has so helped them to deepen their understanding and their appreciation mm-hmm. and their participation uh, in the Holy Mass. Yeah. No, no, I've had a number of priests tell me it wasn't until they they uh, either assisted or celebrated the old rite that they fully understood and then brought a, a new sacrality and devotion to the new one, because, it, it, it again, yes. one feeds the other. It stands That's on the right. back of the other. But it is, you, as you mentioned, Your Eminence, and I would add Mother Angelica's name to that list of, uh, you know, uh, martyrs for the faith fighting and being oh, yes. abused by, <laughs> yes. by uh, authorities yes. at, at times um, over the liturgy, uh, let, let's face it. Um, it is curious and bizarre to me that at the same time that the Vatican is inviting Protestants and Anglicans to walk with the the Roman Catholic Church in this synod, we are basically treating very faithful Catholics of a living, beautiful tradition of the Church as if they're lepers and saying there's no room for you at this inn. I mean, George Weigel called uh, Tradiciones Custodes theologically incoherent, pastorally divisive and unnecessary. Uh, Bishop Thomas Tobin of Provin- Providence is calling on the Church to support those attached to the old right. Do you think this is going to be an ongoing struggle here? And how best to, to fight it? No, it, it will be. And uh, my my counsel to people is continue to do what you've been doing. This is, uh, this is nurturing your faith. This is nurturing your closeness to your, to your bishop, uh, your closeness to the whole Church. And, uh, and that is the way that uh, we can best fight this battle and then to vindicate our rights in the church, to, to make recourses when injustices are done to, to legitimate communities of the faithful. And, of course, there are also institutes of the consecrated life or societies of apostolic life whose particular charism is the celebration of the, the, uh, of the, uh, of the liturgy according to the more ancient usage, the Roman rite according to the more ancient usage, and, and to promote that. And they have a—it's their right to do that. So I believe that there, uh, that there will continue to be a, a very strong uh, response to, to the situation, and, and uh, mm-hmm. God willing, and I'm sure that our Lord will bless it, uh, that uh, we will return to a, a, a regular free usage uh, uh, it, it, regular free usage of the more uh, ancient f- f- uh, usage of the of the Roman rite. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, in the meantime, uh, it's going to be very difficult when many of these, these uh, priests are not allowed to celebrate the Latin Mass in a parish setting. So I guess this goes underground, like uh, as it was in days gone by and in communist China. I guess that's where the whole world is now. Uh, Your Eminence, in December, Pope Francis wrote a letter praising the work of Sister Janine Gramic, the head of the very controversial New Ways Ministries, a group uh, uh, condemned by the Bishops' Conference in the U.S., uh, two previous pontificates. And the Pope praised her work for uh, her outreach to LGBTQ Catholics. Uh, His letter fully contradicts John Paul II and Ratzinger's 1999 admonition against her work. What are your thoughts on this letter and the message it sends to the Church and the wider world? Well, the Church's response to the New uh, Ways uh, ministry, and at that time he was still alive, Father Nugent and Sister Janine Gramic, 
is found in a document of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. It was published in the Acta Apostolic Sedis, the official uh, uh, organ of communication of the of, of the Church. Uh, in 1999, and you can read it there, and what's written there is as true today as when it was written. And uh, what these personal acts of the Pope are, are exactly that. These are acts that he is, is taking on uh, personally, but they have nothing to do with the Church's teaching, as far as I'm concerned. What I read uh, 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 that was quoted in the, in the, in the media uh, of the letter uh, or letters, I'm not sure, uh, uh, which he has written to to Sister Janine. Uh, these are simply the opinions of a, of a of a man, but they have nothing to do with the the, the magisterium of the church. That's found very carefully set forth mm. in uh, in that document. And if, when a document is published in the Act Apostolic Status, uh, this is very significant. Uh, it indicates to us that it is, a, in a particular way, an expression uh, of the Church's doctrine and discipline. It's being reported, Your Eminence, that the Holy See's latest proposals to reform the Knights of Malta threaten its status as a sovereign state. Now, to give the audience a little background here, the order experienced a governance crisis in 2016. That was sparked by a condom distribution scandal that resulted in Pope Francis ousting the then Grand Master and imposing years of Vatican-mandated reforms. In 2020, Francis appointed his latest envoy to oversee those reforms, Cardinal Sil Silvano Tomasi. Uh, last year, he gave Tomasi powers to override the Knights' existing constitution and governance structures. Now, according to Tomasi's latest draft of the proposed new constitution, the Knights of Malta would be subject to the Holy See. In a letter to the Knights members obtained by the Associated Press, the Knights' Grand Chancellor, Albrecht von Bussenlager, said he would normally raise objections directly with the Holy See, but, quote, that avenue has been closed to me, end quote. What do you make of these reforms, and why would the Holy See want the Order of Malta to be subject to the Holy See? I, honestly, I don't, I don't know. I still have the title of the Cardinal Patron of the Sovereign Military Hospital Order of St. John of Jerusalem, Rhodes, and of Malta, which is the formal name uh, but I haven't had any function since that crisis, which you described in 2016, and I don't receive any communications. But I know I, I, I did serve from November of uh, 2014 uh, the order uh, and studied carefully its history. And uh, Pope Paschal II, who, who originally recognized uh, the order, wanted it to have this sovereign status in order that it could carry out more effectively. I, I don't understand exactly what this, what this all means, but I would say this, that if the final document states that the, the order is subject absolutely to the Holy See, not just with regard to the requirements of the, of, uh, of the consecrated members of the, of the professed knights, uh, then I, would, I can only imagine that the other nations would not accept any more uh, uh, representation, separate representation from the Order of Malta. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it is a sovereign order, and it has enjoyed that sovereignty all these years, and now that's being threatened. And to the outsiders, that may not seem like a very big deal, but this, this, has been, this Order of Malta has been around for uh, centuries, and uh, that sovereignty was a part of its function. So, Raymond Cardinal Burke, thank you for the clarity. Great to see you back, and, of course, your insight. We continue to pray for your good health yes, and you. uh, ongoing recovery. Thank you. Thank you for all your prayers, and I thank everyone who has prayed for me. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. And and Cardinal Burke's website is at cardinalburke.com.